This is the Daily Tech News for January 16th, 2014. I'm Tom Merritt. Now, if you recall, I'm actually not here right now. No, you're not hallucinating. I recorded this a little earlier. Uh, but I am recording the Sword and Laser video shows. So I asked you guys to send in some news, and the response was fan. Fantastic. Thank you all for doing so. Got some old friends in there, got some new friends in there, got some familiar faces, uh, but uh, really enjoyed listening to all these, and thanks everybody for contributing. Before we get to them, though, I do want to tell you about a couple of headlines in the news this morning. TechCrunch reports Spotify is selling enough ads and upselling enough free users into paid users that they can loosen up a little. Spotify announced today it is eliminating all limits on free ad-supported web listening in all countries. Bloomberg Businessweek reports Facebook added a very Twitter-like feature. In the top right of the Facebook news feed, personalized content from around Facebook, not just your friends, will show up as a sort of a trending topics feature, even listed by geography. Sound familiar? And WTOP reports Starbucks executives confirmed that the coffee shop's mobile app has been storing passwords in clear text, meaning anyone who had your phone could connect it to a computer and read the password as well as a username, email, and geolocation tracking points. Starbucks admits they knew this was the case, but they have security measures now in place related to that, although they did not specifically say the passwords are no longer in plain text. Not very comforting. My advice, change your password on a PC and don't use the Starbucks app ever on a mobile device until they make sure this is fixed. Okay, that's a quick look at the headlines. Now, Darren Kitchen, you know him, he's usually with me on Fridays, comes from Hack5, has been at ShmooCon and he's got a little report for us. What did you find out, Darren? Hey, Tom, I'm about to board an aircraft to Washington, D.C. for ShmooCon, the conference full of moose. Anyway, it's a uh, hacker conference, and while many of you may not have ventured into that kind of realm, I figured I'd give you kind of an insight into what myself and Hack5 and tens of thousands of security professionals and hackers for hire, federal agents, penetration testers, whatever you want to call us, we get together several times a year to share a pint of beer and share the latest exploits, and this will be no different. This is actually the 10th year for ShmooCon. Um, to give that some perspective, DEF CON, the big one in the United States, just had their 21st year in Las Vegas, and the CCC has been going for 30 in Germany. So we're expecting some really big talks, uh, one from a world-renowned security researcher, Bruce Schneier, uh, titled NSA Capabilities and Countermeasures, so that's going to be a packed room. There may even be some O-Day drops on Samsung phones, so we'll see. That may allow white hats and black hats alike to pwn some smartphones. Um, but, you know, otherwise, it's all about, the energy is about building a better system. I mean, you can't fix what you don't know is broken until you break it. So, you know, while some may be really paranoid about bringing a phone or laptop to a hostile environment like a hacker con, Really, it's about pointing out flaws and coming up with novel ways to fix them. So while we aren't collectively your mainstream Apple and Googles with flashy product announcements, we are the guys behind the scenes fighting the good fight for open access and civil liberties and privacy and, well, maybe just a little bit of harmless hijinks. So for Hack5, I'm Darren Kitchen reporting en route to ShmooCon. I'm going to follow up with you tomorrow. Until then, back to you, Tom. Thank you, Darren Kitchen. Of course, you can find more great stuff from Darren at hak5.org. That's hack 5 Dot org. Check out their shop. They got some amazing stuff in the shop there. All right, now to the news from you. This is our discussion section, and you're the host. You're the discussion section. And we're going to start off with Rich from lovely Cleveland. You're going to, you get to hear him. You've probably heard me read his emails for years and years and years. Now Rich is going to speak to you. Also, I got to point out, he was the first one to get in the news from you, and he hit the 30 second post that I originally required everyone to do. So well done, Rich from lovely Cleveland. He'll kick us off. Take it away, Rich. Hey, Tom, one thing I think that really needs to be touched upon is how low initial 4K setups seem to be coming at. We got Vizio, an established mid-range brand coming in at $1,000, and Dell's UltraSharp line, which is a premium professional line coming in at, what, $700 for a 28-inch 4K monitor? Both are coming in at replacement level prices for existing products. If both deliver on quality, how much room for margins will there be once low-end OEMs really come in at bargain basement prices? The concern has to be, will cheap 4K edge out all but the highest volume manufacturers, leaving players like Sony and LG really to be edged out? This is Rich from Love the Cleveland, signing out. 
Hello, Tom and DTNS listeners. This is Dominic in Mesa. On Current Geek Episode 2, there was a prediction that 4K and 8K resolutions are speeding towards consumers faster than any format previously. I think it's shown that it's CES with the price drops of 4K TVs. Although, in my humble opinion, this is true, it is inconsequential. This is similar to the Pixel Wars, the digital cameras. Consumers just won't care about 4K, let alone 8K. They definitely won't care as much as the first HD sets that hit the market. Plus, it's going to cause another layer of confusion with SD, HD, UHD, with formats like DVD, Blu-ray, streaming, which one can play what. I really think this is TV manufacturers attempting to drum up popularity for higher resolutions as there's very little innovation in the TV manufacturing industry. The only industry that can really benefit from these higher resolutions is the gaming industry because they're the only ones that are prepared for it. Thank you, Tom and DTNS for this opportunity. Wearable technology is one of the latest trends coming out of CES, but the trends could suffer from an IT professional echo chamber effect with a Silicon Valley and IT press amplify and broadcast technology. But as a normal citizen, while admittedly interested in tech, the case for products like Google Glass, watches, rings, and other gear is not clear. Although the products are admittedly cool and great for the early adopter, the public will need to see that killer application or use case before adoption goes widespread. Hi Tom, this is Anthony from Long Island, New York. I love your new show and I love my Fitbit Force, or I did until a rash appeared on my wrist. A Google search confirmed that this was starting to be a widespread issue and I even saw a piece on this morning's news. Fitbit is aware of the problem, released a statement and said they are offering refunds or exchanges for other Fitbit devices. Keep up the good work, I'll keep listening to your show until it gives me a rash. Moving to IP version 6 is what we expected to take place years ago due to the shortage of IP version 4 public addressing space. With the help of services like designated private addressing and network address translation, we were able to temporarily remedy the shortage of IP addresses. It seems, however, with the introduction of the Internet of Everything and mobile computing, the window of IP version 4 public addressing space is getting smaller, resulting in much more demand being put on the implementation of IP version 6. This has been a brief IP update by Paul. Hi, I'm Nathan Locke, and here's my roundup of the latest tech news in the UK. Set-top box manufacturer Humax have just released a firmware update, making them the first manufacturer to implement the Dial, that's Discovery and Launch Protocol, for the UK's FreeSat platform. This means that users can now beam YouTube videos straight to their set-top box from their mobiles, without the need to pair their device, and it will automatically launch the YouTube application on the set-top box. So, Humax, how about implementing a full Chromecast capability next? UK mobile network operator O2 have decided to close its wallet service after less than two years. The rumours are that the number of active users were tiny. Like rival operator Orange's service QuickTap, it appears after the free cash or cashback period finishes, the novelty tends to wear off with the users. This isn't the first time the UK network has experimented with mobile money. There was also the O2 credit card, which lasted just one year, and only time will tell what this means for their involvement in the forthcoming Weave e-commerce platform. This is T. Joe, Code for Sale LLC, reporting for the Daily Tech News Show with Tom Merritt. Today's headline is Android on the Atom. Dell's new line of Android tablets are leaving some developers wondering just how long it'll be before someone manages to boot a copy of Windows running natively under Android. With its dual-core Intel processor and graphics card, these tablets may have everything it takes to deliver a genuine Windows experience, all safely sandboxed as a native Android application. But will we really see a copy of Windows booting under Android anytime soon? It's hard to say, but with the continued gains made in mobile VM development, the possibilities are real. The real question is, will Microsoft Windows ever appear as an app in the Google Play Store? The jury's out on that one. This is T. Joe, Code for Sale LLC, reporting for the Daily Tech News Show with Tom Merritt. Good day. Hey, Tom. It's Randall Bennett from Vidpresso, and I'm so excited to hear about your new show. Um, I thought I'd call and give you a quick opinion on tech, my quick 30-second opinion. Uh, Some people are saying that apps are going to replace the web, and that as desktop computers and laptop computers get replaced with tablets and phones, that native apps are going to be the most important thing, and that web apps are kind of going to go the way of the dinosaur. 
Um, that seems like a completely flawed notion. I don't think you can kill an open platform. Um, if someone's using it and someone's finding utility, that open platform will at least stick around until those people get bored of it. So I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon with the web. All the people who are counting out the web, I think they're going to be on the wrong end of history. See ya. Hi, Tom. On January the 13th, there was an interesting discussion centered around quantum computing and Bitcoin. It's worth pointing out that the problem is not necessarily with mining, which will always adjust its own difficulty every 2016 blocks, but with public-private key crypto itself. If quantum computers were sufficiently developed, Bitcoin would have to move to upgrade itself to prevent the ECDSA algorithm from breaking, which would actually allow people to compromise the private keys of public Bitcoin addresses. Highly theoretical and possible to mitigate, however, so there's no real cause for concern today. Love the show! This is DJ with some insight on the Nest acquisition by Google. The internet is up in arms over the $3.2 billion deal, but many question why. As a Nest owner, I'll tell you exactly why, and that's Google's track record of killing services it perceives to be unused. Nothing says that somewhere two, year, two or three years down the road that they won't kill the cloud control functionality of these devices, destroying half the reason of purchasing them. Nest users have every right to be worried about this. Here's hoping they treat Nest as they have Motorola and keep their hands off. Just wanted to give some feedback regarding Nest. Um, I'm up in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and um, i got to say that <laughs> the comment of, of uh, getting no support from Nest um, because they're you know under the Google umbrella um, would be worth it to me. Uh, as it stands right now, Nest support is pretty abysmal. It takes three to four days to get a, an email response back on, a, on simple questions. And in addition to that, um, Frankly, they have absolutely useless data. One of the big things I looked forward to with the Nest uh, was being able to kind of look at every single day and see every single day. You can only ever look back about 10 days. What I'm really hoping for and looking forward to uh, with Google having a hand in Nest is actual access to useful data and more data as opposed to the very watered down and useless amount of data that uh, I do receive. And um, with any luck, a, a more community support. Um, it seems to be a strength of Google uh, is things can be fixed. It's just a matter of uh, searching for it. Thanks. Keep up the great work. Love the show. Hey, Tom. This is Nicole here. Um, I have just gotten over the very dreaded CES flu, so uh, apologies if my voice is not as uh, melodious as it, as, as it used to be. Um, so just very quickly, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, Google's acquisition of Nest. Well, I think it, it behooves us to be a little bit wary of one company controlling all our daily movements. Uh, it's also kind of exciting to see what a big company like Google can really do to sort of open up the future and what the Internet of Things can really be. That's me, that's Nicole, and if you want to follow what I'm doing, you can go to Engadget.com or you can just go to Twitter.com slash Nicole where I tweet about my horrible, horrible flu and things of that nature. All right. Bye, Tom. Bye, guys. Hey, Tom. This is Richard. I want to make a comment about uh, Google and how they're introducing new users to G+. We saw a while back what they did with YouTube, where they uh, forced you to start an account if you wanted to comment, um, which, P.S., did not clean anything up. And now we see that they're allowing uh, limited G plus users to send uh, mail to Gmail accounts that I think people might associate with spam. Uh, I know they were probably told by advertisers that individuals are spending a lot of time on social networks and that's where a lot of the advertising money is going to go. But these first impressions being forced on something and spam are going to be hard to overcome. The odd thing, I've recently seen Hangouts and I think they're incredible technology and the iOS app is beautiful and I think they're making a huge mistake forcing this on people. Peace and love. Peace and love. Tom Merritt, this is Scott Johnson, and I am calling about all of these acquisitions that Google's making, and it seems like more lately than usual, but perhaps it's, you know, if you look at the overall extent of Google's acquisitions over the years, it's probably averages out to be a little bit more even than I think, but they're in the news now because of this Nest acquisition, which was a pretty big deal, and over $3 billion is no small uh, bag of change, assuming everything gets approved and done. Um, how long, this is kind of me asking you for a prediction, but how long do you think we have until there's a major backlash against Google for 
getting too big. And I ask this and say this because we've seen it before with Microsoft and Apple and others. They get big enough, and before you know it, everybody hates on you. I predict personally 2015 is going to be a bad year for Google, a bad PR year, a year where people start going, okay, we get it. You want to own everything, and you will own everything if you keep this up. Anyway, just my two cents on that. Love to hear your thoughts uh, now or down the road. Uh, but one way or the other, keep up the great, awesome work as usual. And uh, I'll talk to you soon, man. Bye. Hey, it's Adam Christensen from the MacCast. I wanted to call in and comment this week on Google buying Nest. First and foremost, congratulations to the I, former iPod overseer, Tony Fidel, and his crew. $3.2 billion. That's a lot of scratch for, uh, I don't know, beer money. <laughs> That's a lot of beer. Anyway, I also just wanted to say I wasn't shocked by the strong sort of negative reaction that the Internet has had to the news. As a matter of fact, I felt a little bit of it myself. You know, I personally love Google products. I use products like Gmail. I also have a Nest thermostat and just recently purchased a Nest Protect, and so I love Nest as well. I'm just not so sure that I love them together. I think the issue is becoming that any one Google product or service taken sort of by itself is pretty cool, but when you start to imagine things in aggregate, it does tend to get a little bit scary how much information Google potentially has on all of us. You know, they see us through their Google Glass. They can read about our lives in our Gmail and Google Plus accounts. They can follow us through Google Maps and navigation. And now they have a way into our homes. They also have their whole autonomous vehicle program and they're building a robot army that I think DARPA is very, very proud of. So I think don't we have the right, actually, maybe even a duty to at least question their motives? You know, people like to joke about Google becoming Skynet, but frankly, some days, I think the joke might not be all that funny. Hey, Tom and Tom's listeners. It's me, Molly Wood. I just wanted to say congrats to you, Tom, on the new show. I'm definitely going to be listening, and I look forward to being among your rotating cast of co-hosts. And, you know, a funny thing happened just yesterday. Somebody on Twitter posted, Jason Richardson from Twitter, posted that he had just gone back and listened to our 2009 Buzz Out Loud double rant on net neutrality and how he thought that it was totally still relevant to the net neutrality argument today. I have to say, I just listened to it and I completely agree. And so I am going to tweet it and I want people to keep talking about it because, of course, there's been a lot of conversation about net neutrality this week. And it feels like almost between 2009 and now people sort of forgot what was going on. So listen to our rant. It'll be a nice little reminder. Get you all fired up again. But it'll also be a reminder of how awesome it is when Tom joins the fight. Because, you know, you've spent a lot of time being the moderator, being the host of a panel show, and you haven't had as many opportunities to just jump in there and get fired up. And I got to say, dude, I'm looking forward to some of that from you. Host your show, do it your way, and join the fight. Because when Tom gets his rant on, you guys, it is epic. I am definitely going to be listening to Tom. And you know what? In the spirit of tech news, I'm going to go ahead and make a prediction based on this crazy story that I'm seeing kicking around the web in CNBC today. I think maybe Yahoo is going to buy AOL. Good luck, Tom. I will be listening. Hey, Tom. Patrick calling in from France with a tech thought, which actually came from a quote by Aaron Schwartz. Uh, he said, be curious, read widely, try new things. I think a lot of what people call intelligence just boils down to curiosity. And that is an already an awesome quote. I, I really love it. But it got me thinking about hackers and what being a hacker means. Um, and I came to the conclusion that it's at its core, it's really about deconstructing and understanding and, and trying to go as far as you can with something. And that's something we're we're losing sight of as the the world is introduced to hacking and all its in all its different variations and all its different forms and just to add to to, to the to the thought i really think that we can't get rid of hacking without getting rid of curiosity and when you put the question in those terms it becomes pretty obvious that we don't want to get rid of either so there would be a lot more to be said about all of this but uh for now, I'll stop here. Hey, we're not done yet. I'm going to butt back in one more time because we got one piece of feedback that I thought I'd share with you about our Google Voice phone number. He's jacked, man. You used an Austin number. Awesome. Keep it weird, bro. 
All right, our final piece of feedback is not from you, it's from me, for you. You guys did a fantastic job. I couldn't be happier. You saved my bacon, uh, so I really, really appreciate your eternal support. If you've been wanting to know about how you could support the show, here's one way. You just did it. Send me stuff. We'll have more ways for you in the future as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for helping out and being part, like really seriously being part of the show. Hey, if you didn't hear your submission, please don't despair. Tune in tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> we've, we're sort of, Jenny, our producer, was sort of like, it's like being the all-star manager. Like, how long do you go? with the star pitcher and you don't want to leave the good folks in the bullpen uh, so we did hold a few for tomorrow check out the dailytechnewsshow.com uh, so that you, you can see all of the information about the shows and we'll have some more stuff tomorrow and don't forget you can have a voice in what stories we cover all the time at our subreddit dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com I will be back probably with some quick headlines maybe on Monday just because it's Martin Luther King Jr. Day I won't have any guests but we'll be back with the full real show on Tuesday. But but wait, we got we got another news from you coming up tomorrow. So don't forget about that. You can email us feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Let us know what you thought of how well everyone did. And of course, visit our website at dailytechnewsshow.com. You are the guest tomorrow. I'll talk to you then. This podcast is part of the Frog Pants Studios Network. For more information about this and other shows, visit frogpants.com. Audio program so good, it's like you're there!